I am happy to announce Sam Drogi, our seminar speaker today. Sam received an undergraduate degree at the University of Maryland and a master's at the State University of New York, Syracuse. Most of his career has been spent at the USGS Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. Um, he's coordinated the North American Breeding Bird Survey Program, developed the North American Amphibian Monitoring Program, the BioBlitz, Cricket Crawl, and Frog Watch USA programs, and worked on the design and evaluation of monitoring pro programs. Currently, he is developing an inventory and monitoring program for, program for native bees, online identification guides for North American bees at discoverlife.org, and with Jessica Zelt, is reviving the North American Bird Phenology Program. And today, he will be talking to us about math, meaning, and monitoring of wild bee populations. Thank you. So, I, I've just been enjoying my conversations with people, and I'm hoping to have more. Um, I do have to say that this is a tough audience for, at least for me, maybe you're not a tough audience, you might be a tough audience for other reasons, but uh, to develop a talk for, because you usually have a much more focused, uh, you know, mono culture of reason that I'm talking about. Bee people, uh, statistics, uh, trend analysis, um, identification of insects, or something like this. So what I am doing is I'm amalgamating on a variety of different things around the theme of native bees and monitoring native bees, uh, evaluating them and talking about the techniques, uh, how we chose them, which ones we're using, and um, hoping that a lot of that applies to, um, you know, erase bees, add in, you know, crustaceans or whatever it might be, and that some of the ways of thinking um, are going to be useful and informative, if not the topic area. And I hope to just, you know, show you and talk about some very minor aspects of bees. We usually give week-long um, identification classes for bees that will intrigue you and um, cause you maybe to um, do a little more work and thinking about um, native bee populations, which is surprisingly um, uh, little known in terms of what the average person knows about bees is about honeybees. So um, I also try, this is my important slide. Yeah. Uh, they're all important, but this is my important slide because um, this is a point I try and get across to every all the groups that I talk to because this is really in terms of uh, design and theory and creating a program. This is what it's about. This is my current analogy. So I'm trying it out for you guys for the first time. So let's say you're not feeling well. You know, multiple hangnails, some halitosis, uh, you know, headaches unexplained, and all that kind of thing. Well, at some point you would probably would go to the doctor and they would give you a prognosis about you know how long you have to live and um, you would accept that or not. But you would end up going to the doctor. You would not not go to the doctor. And um, so the analogy here is you have to um, create a study or you're, you're in graduate school or you have a project or a program or you're a manager of uh, you know, wildlife uh, in a uh, park and you're thinking about monitoring something. So I should point out that my background, as you heard, is almost all about monitoring. So I think, and when I say monitoring, you can I've tried to translate that to a more generic monitoring or research or looking at differences. So when I say monitoring, it's a, it should be a more broader term. But the idea here is that um, you should also be going to the statistician as they will give you, based on your characteristics, like, well, I was thinking of only putting in three or four sites and that you know, I'm working with insects, and they will give you the probability that you will publish anything out of that <laughs> particular project. So this is the important thing is that, you know, no, nothing that I'm going to tell you is going to be so clarifying that you will be able to, from this talk, set up your whatever it is, study or do bees or anything without consultations with statisticians and biologists on either side. Many of you know this. It's worth repeating. Many of you actually sometimes don't know this. So. Um, so a big picture. As a society, we spend a lot of money on monitoring and therefore on research to some extent. And a lot of that is in satellites. So if you, and people don't think about this because um, it's just something that we just assume is there. But if you actually look at the prices, so this is um, the, as of several years ago, the 26 Earth orbiting satellites that NASA alone, as other agencies that put up satellites, use to parse the environment to give us messages and to measure 
how we're doing as a society and look at global climate change and things like that. And, you know, there's real money. That's, you know, B with a billion dollars that they're spending and um, just on that one agency kind of thing. So you, the, uh, the different departments here, and us as people who are life history organismal folks, we're really the front line, right? So people in general, if you were to talk to them, are much more interested in how is my place that I live or how are the animals or how is the stream and the environment doing. So the kinds of things that we're working on are both rare and unusual and has, um, I think, greater relevance. So doing them well and being able to express things about the environment in terms of organisms are um, really what we're all about and is something that is funded piecemeal rather than globally. So there's my soapbox for the time. And um, so uh, it's a little bit um, oddly shaped there. So I'm wondering if we have some pair. I guess we don't have any options here. So Osmia distincta. I'll throw in some different bee pictures so you know that I am talking about organisms here just to uh, you know, lighten the load of text um, and graphic um, design things. So native bee population. So first of all, just erase everything you know about bees, which is about honeybees. And uh, this is a very different situation. They're analogous to lots of other kinds of insects in the ways that they behave. They're really not, mostly not colonial, and they're individual in um, where they nest. Um, as insects and as a group, they have very high variances. So high variances, systems like that, it doesn't matter what it is, it's going to mean that you have a lower ability, everything else being equal, to be able to detect trends and detect differences in any kind of study. So that has downstream consequences. Um, there are, not, like, not unlike everything else, there are lots of different kinds of biases associated with how you might want to talk about or to count um, uh, these insects. They don't really want to be counted. They're not easily available. And um, another important factor is that a lot of times we might be interested in rare and uncommon species, uh, but the consequences of working with them is that they become very expensive to monitor because of reasons of um, your ability to find them and locate them on the land um, increases a lot. So I'm, I'm giving, what I'm doing here is I'm giving you the summary of what the, uh, would be at the end, at the beginning, so that um, I can reinforce these points later on. So practical issues is that because of some of the things we talked about in the previous slide, what you're going to need to do is um, essentially collect a lot of bees. So um, there is this sort of ethical undercurrent that I don't have time to talk about, but it's an interesting topic, which is for bee studies, and this would hold for a lot of other studies, you essentially, not essentially, you really need to end up with a bunch of dead bees because we can't identify them on the wing like we might be able to do with butterflies, and certainly which we do with birds, but the, um, I'll maybe bring this back up later, but think about bird monitoring, which is one of the things that we do a lot, as, again, as the background of what has been studied in the past has been much more vertebrate oriented. We assume that if you go outside and you go outside and you go outside and you go outside to count birds, that you are counting them in the exact same way and that you have this similar detectability. A bird sings, it's detected, it's written down. So we know, uh, if we think about it a lot, that that's not true, but yet we still do it and then we do all these fancy analyses and, and things like that. That has lots of consequences in terms of issues of bias and inner observer impacts on how our studies are performed. The good thing here is even though we're killing a lot of bees because we can only identify them under the microscope, is that we have voucher specimens. You don't believe that I saw that insect or you don't um, need to worry about the different kinds of capture rates. Well, we have a whole set of specimens that we can go back to and look. Um, and you're not doing the bees a favor, I would argue, in general by um, counting too few or trying to minimize the number of bees that are killed in your captures because ultimately you're probably going to make the kinds of statements you would want to make that have conservation implications because why are you doing this kind of study if not to have conservation implications or implications for agriculture. In the end, you are doing the bees a disservice by not collecting as many as possible. So as a generality, we want to maximize the numbers count counted in our surveys of bees so that you don't run up against the zero line. We don't like a lot of zeros in counts because they are integers and it's just, it's messy statistically to be down there at the, the uh, part of the world where there's zeros and not many samples. 
So you want, because of the, all the kinds of things we talked about before, in terms of high variances, lots of samples, um, so that means lots of bees being killed, and we can talk about that more at the end if you want to get into the ethics of the thing, which is interesting. Um, and the, the more, again, a very general thing, the more places, the more variables, the more um, independent uh, variables you want to talk about, the more um, we have to deal with that um, in terms of increased sample sizes. And it gets big really quickly, usually, because of uh, what insects are. So something that's not talked about a lot is that in the process of um, uh, work with bees, while we, in birds, for example, we minimize the identification issue downstream, after we've counted it, we're ready to do you know, our analyses. We just have to get them into Excel. You, after you put out your traps or whatever it is for bees, you have a lot of work in terms of processing time and identification is the bottleneck. So there's right now very few people who can accurately identify all the bees that you might have in a collection. So you're going to spend far more time. So we estimate about 80% of the time of a project is not in the field, but in the processing, you know, cleaning the specimens down through pinning to labeling to databasing to identification and verification of that identification afterwards. So within that bee, and I would say probably a lot of other insects, you have a lot of post-field time to, to work into the system. Um, so good pollination monitoring projects, you know, very, uh, these are very much generalities, clearly defined questions, repeatable, bring that variance, whatever you can do to bring the variance down um, and uh, you know, minimize your costs and your travel times among sites and these will, will, will bring up how and why and how are some of these things influencing what decisions we make in terms of what the uh, programs and what the uh, techniques we use are um, actually, that we actually do in a, in a little bit here. And then, um, and then we want our, whatever we're doing to sample, to sample as much of the community of bees as possible. It's impossible because of the techniques that are used in Thalthra bomboides. Um, to really get into um, sampling all the bee community because everything, all the techniques are biased. So bias in this particular world um, is that we have this problem that um, we never truly know how many uh, bees and what kinds are out there. At this point, we have no, uh, there's no even concocted situation that we can come up with where we know what the true population is. And so, we, and we essentially know that any technique that we're going to be using is going to have uh, a biased reflection of the true population um, uh, in it. And so what we need to do is uh, develop a way of uh, investigating the different techniques so that we minimize those biases and be satisfied that we're not um, talking about the entire or the true population and that it's somehow related to what's going on. This brings up an entire talk, which would be this relationship between estimating things and the problems that estimation procedures have versus using indices and using indices in a smart way to minimize um, the known factors of bias rather than the unknowns, which of course are unknown, so you can't minimize them, um, and all the <coughs> trade-offs and controversies that are associated with that discussion. So just a few things that we know about in terms of uh, it's uh, bees that affect um, our, uh, that are biasing factors or are affecting um, how we do the counts and I think are brought in well sometimes and not brought in well others in terms of how we make choices on when and where to study. Um, so one is phenology. Um, again, I have a background in bird and bird sampling and so we all know that all you need to do is go in mid-June and run your you know, breeding census counts and that all the birds are at their peak in terms of their detectability. They're all lined up in a row. All those phenologies are available, which of course I'm being facetious in that that's not completely true, but it certainly is much truer in birds than it is in um, uh, bees. So Agapostum and Texanus, you know, here's a phenological chart. That's January, that's December. You know, we have different, sometimes there's more than one brood, there's peaks, some of this is males coming out, some of it's females coming out. Males and females are essentially different species in terms of how they're parts in the environment. You may or may not be interested in tracking them separately, and they often have things like males are coming out first and the females come out 
um, end of the year systems. Um, the males are all being produced, all kinds of crazy things. Here's the same genus, but a different species. It's shifted uh, further into the summer. Um, if we look at, that's uh, Agapostum inverescens. Um, if you look, and this is one of the reasons that I like working with bees, I get to look at them under the microscope and they're fantastic looking. Um, just within an, a one genus of bee, here's Andrina fenningeri, March, April, uh, that's the, the species there. Uh, Aerogenia, um, so the uh, first species was working off of maples mostly. This one's working off of um, spring beauties and bottom lands. Then we're moving later in the summer. This species is more late spring, um, wide variety of field flowers. Uh, that's Critigii there. Again, we're getting little parallax issues. Uh, Andrina fulvipennis is in sand plains within late season composites. Uh, that's fulvipennis. Uh, here to Cincta is goldenrods in late fall. So we have these huge things. When we look at data, we have a study where we're looking on power lines. We're looking at two different kinds of treatments of power line um, vegetation types. And there were significant, uh, significant treatment effects. So the different colors are the treatment effects. But when we do our correspondence analysis of all the data, it's not treatment that comes out as different. It's the three different sampling periods within the <coughs> spring fauna. Extremely different sets of bees were out during that relatively short period of time. So if you back up, if you are running samples across different sites and your different sites are run in different times of year, if you don't block on time, then you get this kind of, of uh, issue that's either adding variance if you manage to split your, um, your study sites among all the different time periods, or worse, it's biased because you know all the ones in northern uh, Iowa over here, here's Des Moines and here's uh, well, we've lost track of what my uh, geography, Grinnell, uh, <laughs> in Iowa. And um, so yeah, here's a different study. This is on one site in uh, a set of power lines that we sampled every two days. And you can just see that essentially everything has its own phenological um, uh, imprint and that each species is doing something different. On top of that is the fact that because this is a flower-driven system, there's a lot of reasons that bees would try and match when flowers bloom. And what we know about flowers is that early spring, late spring, you're pushing that bloom time forward and backward on your flower communities. And so if you each year decide, maybe it's, and um, so let me just say, if each year you decide, well, we're just gonna sample on April 15th, April 27th, you fix dates, well, your phenological windows are back and forth. So you, and you have a two-year study, again, you can see how that could add in a tremendous amount of bias to your results. And if you're doing it over a long-term trend, trend, well, maybe it adds variance, which is a negative because it means it obscures long-term trends. If you're doing a scientific study and you've split your study across two years and you have different inf uh, effects you're looking at both years, well, you now you have confounding effects going on. So within a season, you have all this individual species stuff um, so every window you take is slicing different chunks of the community. And then across um, years, you have big year effects. I mean, just contrast last year with the previous one. Um, this is one of the xylocopas. So vegetation is another area where we've worked on a lot of um, biasing issues. So uh, for example, willow has six, eight species of um, andrina that specialize on willow. <coughs> Um, and this is true for several other species of, um, of bees. There's uh, species that are specialists on cactus. You just go down the list, about 60% of all bee species are plants, are plant pollen specialists. In other words, the female feeds their young pollen from one or a genus of plants. And um, so the issue is that a lot of times then that gets wrapped up in sampling issues. So if you're either not sampling on willow or if you have what we, I'll just explain later, our sampling uh, unit of choice are small little traps, these little bowls, and you place the bowls underneath the willow tree, you still don't catch any of these willow specialists, or you catch very, very few, even though above you is this cloud of bees um, sampling. So this, so we can do many, many examples where you have high resources, low resources, um, different kinds of uh, vegetation, where you place the traps are influencing the number and kinds of bees that are falling into your traps. 
and the ratio of the number of bees in your trap and the ratio uh, and the um, number, it's not the ratio, the number of bees in your traps and the number of bees in the, in the environment, those ratios are all over the place. So in monitoring, we pretend that that goes away when we look at it over time and we block on most of the other factors. There are reasons why we're probably wrong to some extent on that. Um, and uh, study areas, if you don't account for that, then you're, um, you, and you don't account for what it is being expressed by your counts. Um, you're uh, making presentations that you're talking about all bees or regions bees when the reality is you're talking about bat traps proclivities for capturing or not capturing certain types. Um, spring vernal populations are another um, uh, area just to mention a couple. So in this particular case, if you put the spring vernal community or, or forbs that are blooming mostly on the forest floor, you put out uh, sampling traps down here and these load. These load with tons and tons of bees and it's probably, and we've done experiments where just moving a few feet away from where the floral resources are and the, the bees disappear. So there's really strong relationships in this community between at least overall capture rates and the presence of blooming resources, whereas if bloom is up here, then that sort of, in general, not always, disappears. And complications among complications in terms of those sorts of things. In terms of surveying techniques, there's a, a basic set here uh, that are pretty easy to talk about and some are just going to drop out of the conversation right away as possibilities that um, most people want to incorporate into their projects. One is the um, use a variety of names, pan trapping, bull trapping, morikis, funnels, veins, glycol traps. They all are taking the observation that bees are attracted to uh, flower colors and will somehow, because they'll investigate those colors, end up in a trap of some kind or another. Um, We'll talk about these more. These are pretty useful. Netting is the standard that we would expect an entomologist to use. They go out and catch them. We will not talk about this very much because usually this is, in most of these circumstances, a very highly biased situation. We give everyone in this room a net and we all go out to the same field. Well, obviously our captures are going to be really different because of different skill levels. We give five different highly skilled, which we have done, um, uh, bee people who have for years been massively collecting bees and we go to the same field and we might catch about the same number but the differences will be also huge because we have developed different proclivities on how we see how we catch and what parts of the micro environment we parse when we are thinking about and looking for bees and our skill levels are still high so observer bias and netting is huge despite the fact that we can catch bees four standardized techniques. If you want rare things, then you're talking about <coughs> using netting to some extent in there. So none of these are off the charts, but in terms of uh, very uniform standardized ways, we're going to focus on uh, these kinds of pan traps techniques. Malaise traps were basically an open tent. These blunder into it as do other insects and they get it caught into a trapping hood. This is actually a great technique. Problem is $250 per trap. Um, it covers an entire season, but one bear can, you know, t you take you out for several thousand dollars, and your sample sizes are still restricted to that one trap type of thing. Um, Count said flowers had the same problem of observer techniques. There's differences in how people do this. Additionally, essentially, you can't really identify even bumblebees well on the wing. So, um, you know, we could talk about that more, but Count said flowers have limited use but sometimes are useful in agricultural purposes when you're just trying to get a visitation kind of rate. But as a general survey or analysis technique, it's something that has too much flavorings of observers. Additionally, you have to be out there when flowers and bees are active, and that window of time is relatively short in the long day. And when you add in uh, uh, visits across many sites, it also has a limitation. A uh, trap nest, that's this kind of thing where you build a place that a bee likes to live. Those can work well. Um, the problem is only about 5% of all the bees are trap nestable. And um, uh, so you're missing an entire big chunk of the community. So if your community of bees is, uh, is, is the ones that use trap nests or that's a reflection of what you're trying to get at, this is a very nice standardized way because you can get mortality and fecundity and parasitism rates and all kinds of things using it. But um, again, usually it has limited use in 
a lot of people's studies because the kinds of bees they're interested in or the kinds of environments they're interested in putting together. Bait stations, I only mention because we'll talk about them later. They're useful in um, the tropics for uh, orchid bees. Really neat system, really low variances, great monitoring technique, has no real application up here, unfortunately. So there you go. Uh, the best thing, well, other than moving down to the tropics. So pan traps is what we'll talk about. We've talked about this in a general way. Uh, bees, when they wake up, this is the story, OK? Bees, when they wake up in the morning, have forgotten what they did the day before. They are parsing the environment initially for color. Do I have that in the next one? No. But uh, so the environment in general is green earth tones and some kind of gray scale for sky and water. So flowers have developed this very unique signal. So it's very easy for a bee to lock into I investigate colors. We'll see if it's any good. If it's any good, then I'm going to use several other factors to um, decide to use that from that point on. So bowls mimic those colors. They investigate the bowls or the traps of some kind that have color, and they're caught. So um, the nice thing is that they can be very inexpensive. Um, it eliminates a lot of the observer issues because the bowls are doing the trapping and observers not doing the trapping. Um, captures a relatively broad spectrum of bees. Almost all bees can end up in here, but it certainly is biased away from, say, treetop ones unless you move the bowls into the levels of trees, which is usually, you know, a, you know on the heroic side of sampling. Um, the downside is you get no host plant data because everything is um, washed off in the water or the propylene glycol that you're using, and we are missing a certain subset of species or at least undersampling them to a great deal. You increase some of your processing time because the specimens are completely saturated now and you have to wash and dry them, which is one of our specialties. We have YouTube videos on cleaning them. And there are biases as with, but this would be true of anything about when, where, and how you deploy these kinds of traps that have to be accounted for. This is what we would call a bee bowl. And um, there are bees in there. And other things, you have collateral that comes, anything that comes in the color will end up here. And this is usually deployed with just soapy water. Dawn dishwashing liquid is our standard. Blue Dawn, I should say. And we'll get back to that, why Blue Dawn. And um, this is the other one that we're moving to more. This is glycol traps. This is the highly expensive beer cup. Um, and uh, we use propylene glycol, not ethylene glycol. Propylene glycol has, uh, is food grade, and um, we can drink it. I know people who are traveling from Canada to visit me, and they got caught by the US customs people. They're like, what, what's that stuff? And they said, it's propylene glycol. They were like, no, it's got to be something bad. And they drank it to prove that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this, but <laughs> it's possible. So it is non-toxic, which is good, and um, has uh, um, advantages in that. It's both a preservative. It has an extremely low evaporation rate. So even out in the deserts, you can leave these things out for a month, and the liquid component is still in there. has almost essentially no toxicity. And um, uh, the, here's the important thing. So both the bee bowls and the uh, using soapy water and using this is doing the same thing. Bees get caught in the liquid. Um, but the interesting, and volunteers will do them both. So we are dependent on volunteers because we don't have a budget to actually pay people to do surveys. So it turns out that in, I, initially we were going with bee bowls because it's cheaper and I don't have to buy propylene glycol. Well, people will do that for a couple times and then they stop because it's not that it's that hard, but the interesting thing is, um, and I didn't really think about this until <coughs> later, is that there's lots of decisions that have to be made. I can put on the calendar that I'm going out on that particular day, but if it's not a sunny day, you're not gonna get any bee captures. So if it's rainy, then I have to reschedule it. All right, so that's a pain because I have decided to take my kids to soccer the next day, or you, know, you start balancing all these things. It's still small, but at time, it becomes a, a burden. And um, you also then have to go pick them up. Glycol traps essentially act much more like uh, weather stations and other things. So it's uh, the analogy I use is like, um, well, first of all, so you set up a glycol trap in the spring, and then you simply go and filter out the results every week, every two weeks. You can schedule it completely. It can be raining that day. It doesn't matter. And it's a really convenient thing. And it's much more like a weather station in that 
you go back over time. In fact, the same person who is tending the weather station that can be co-located is now tending another set of traps. But you're effectively making only one decision. You make a decision that I'm going to deploy an array, you set it up, and then at, from that point on, you, there's an internal obligation, this is my story, that you continue to do this, and there's more energy in actually pulling the array than actually going out there and tending it. Additionally, um, so it's more like um, brushing your teeth. You don't think about every morning, am I going to brush my teeth this morning or am I not going to brush my teeth this morning? You do have that option, but you have effect effectively erased it because a long time ago, your mother made a decision for you that you will brush your teeth every morning. Maybe you don't, I don't know, but I brush my teeth once in the morning and once in the evening. Um, so it turns out that that little difference right there makes this huge difference in terms of uh, participation. So uh, this year we ran 100 different sites in different woodlands looking at different spring vernal bee faunas and we had 98, we had a, uh, in four states and we just did it all by email, we had 98% um, success in all the volunteers following through and doing all the specimen kinds of things. Elsewhere, it, you know, we get nowhere near that level of participation. These are all not, you know, usually not trained biologists or someone who has to do it. It's all volunteer. Um, so the negatives is glycol is not free. Water is free. And um, that um, you can put these things out in the woods. Ultimately, a lot of times mice, you know, will chew the bottoms out or a bear will come by and, and bother them. So sometimes you end up having to add in some fencing or some way of, of keeping them off. Um, I can tell you later, I don't have time now, the story of using the world's most uh, bitter chemical in trying to drive away animals and why it is so bitter and how it gets all over the place even though you didn't think it would and into your food even. So that was a good story but I'm not going to tell you. Um, <laughs> the, um, another thing that's on the horizon now that we're working with a little bit and I'm interested in, I'll mention only in passing, are vein traps the same idea. This color here attracts things. They're set up, oops, I don't have a picture of that, at, in fields. They have a, they attract proportionately larger bees that are working from longer distances and pulling them in from what appears to be large areas. You can get huge numbers of bees in these traps. So at this point, this is of interest, but it's a smaller fraction. And sometimes you have to be careful that, for example, you don't kill all the queen bumblebees that come out in the spring in the region because the trap is so visible from such a long area. But it, it's useful in certain, certain ways, it's working the same way. So we put out these traps, either glycol traps or uh, the bee bowls in arrays of, of multiples. And what we're doing is we're sampling these bees, nesting mostly in the immediate area. So we have evidence that a lot of the things that end up in bowls are really just working the immediate area. But we're sampling some unknown comment so unknown uh, component of long distance dispersers too. Um, that's a part that we don't quite know enough information about. And um, the, I don't think I want to talk any more about that. Um, but uh, you know, fundamentally we don't have a much of a handle on why did that particular bee end up in that particular bowl. So being able to use estimators or those kinds of things is pretty tricky and plus you know, we also can't use a lot of estimation procedures simply because we're removing things from the population, but a lot of the population parameters are unknown to us. So when we look at traps themselves, a good thing, one of the few that doesn't really seem to have any consequence, is when we tested, and we tested this all up and down the east, was well, if we use a bigger bowl, do we catch more? Um, the answer is no, we don't. All the bowls from, this is the size of a spit cup at the dentist's office, and the problem was we couldn't find them again. So we put them down and, and they would catch as many bees, but you know, finding them was taking a lot of time, it turned out. And we use these big, your basic salad bowl here, all painted with the same con component of paint. And we found that they all caught basically the same number of bees. So that was good. Gives us a lot more opportunity to use a smaller bowl, cut down on costs of schlepping a lot of water around. And pan trap color, you think about, well, flowers are different colors. There's probably some relationship there and here's your standard environment, green, browns, and this color, the um, color of these flowers. And if you think about bee biology, why are all these flowers different shapes? If there was one kind of bee, the honeybee, why isn't there one kind of flower? There's this huge diversity and this huge, really interesting pollination ecology 
um, evolutionary biology going on here. And um, you, some of the pictures that we show give you a hint at, if you look on our Flickr site, you'll see more of this. But there's this, this parallel um, system of uh, differences in body types, shapes, lengths of tongue, architecture, and bees that I think is personally equally as beautiful, um, but is also matching those flowers. So there's all this same, same kind of diversity in, um, in types. And indeed, when we start looking at color preferences of which kind of bowl do you die in, we see that um, the flower, I'm not even showing you all the experiments that you know we're putting out red bowls, green, well, I should mention, red is not, uh, at least in the bees that have been studied to date, red is not a color that bees see. So there may be some bees that see red that we haven't studied, but bees in general do not see red. Butterflies see red, hummingbirds see red, so that'd be a, a note as to why a flower is a red color. But a lot of red flowers also have a yellow center, which means that they're playing both sides of the um, uh, street in terms of what pollinators they're trying to attract. Um, within the color spectrum that they see, they also see into the ultraviolet. This says blue UV, yellow UV, but what we're really talking about is not UV, but is just the in a, you know, inexactness of my um, uh, labeling. It should be fluorescent blue and fluorescent yellow, which is translating ultraviolet colors into a visible part of the spectrum. So this is what we see, and that's what's available in terms of paints. Um, and there's differences here. Note that everything's starting at five, but they're all catching a lot of bees if they're a, a flower color. And it turns out, though, when we start looking at individual species, this is from a different study um, where we caught many, many bees. So you can see here sample sizes here. It's different colors. White clear is a red color, and red is not a red color. I don't know. But so there's red. No, there's red, and there's clear. They catch no bees, so they're essentially our controls. And then each of these are different species. Um, note here that the um, fluorescent blue and the uh, fluorescent blue and the regular blue and the fluorescent yellow and the regular yellow and each of the species I'll show you little vignettes are are essentially catching the same fraction. And this backs up this notion that there's not a difference. There's an augmentation of the um, color. That's Alga chlorella aurata. And that these patterns of color preferences are showing up. But they're showing up at the blue, yellow, and to some extent white, which is, of course, reflecting everything, kinds of parts of the spectrum. And there's interest that you can relate this to the flowers that they're visiting. But there's within species, there's very clear differences in what color, simply colors, they're attracted to. That means, though, that the colors that you're using, even that there are slight variations on color, are going to have consequences in terms of your capture rates. Um, so, and there's a million papers that say that, you know, like their conclusions are bees like yellow more than white. But you change the circumstances, the time of year, the location, and you're going to get a different result because the different groups of bees that you happen to be sampling are going to show these prefer preferences differentially. The bottom line is you need at least those three colors. Uh, when we look at fluorescing colors and we compare them together, we see a huge difference between a fluorescent yellow and a yellow. And um, partially this is, so why is that different from what I just showed you, which was showed you equal results? And this was one of our very first experiments and I realized that we were putting both bowls next to each other in that experiment. So the bees opportunity was which, I'm going to die in a bowl, but which one am I going to die in? So it's going to die in the one that's more yellowy. Uh, but when you spread them apart, and we found that by spreading them apart at some point five meters, you don't get trap interference. In other words, you're getting the same capture rates among all bowls. Um, essentially, a bee is deciding, do I go into that bowl or do I not go into that bowl? And then you even out the capture rates between the yellow and the fluorescent yellow. Um, the tricky, the thing here is though, that um, we have standardized colors now that we've worked the pigments out on so that um, you can buy them and you know all of us can be potentially comparing our same trap results because we're using the exact same color. Unless the pigment people are playing you know, differences. Look at the color spectrograph on some of these things. Here's a fluorescent yellow bowl. So here's the standard at 100% reflectance and this UV, um, this fluorescent which is taking the UV compound and pumping it into this actually green to yellow part here is, you know, boosting it way up. If we look at white, here we have the 100% reflectance. Here's white, which is reflecting all colors. 
and very little. The UV part that bees that we're not seeing, that bees are, are somewhere in this sort of range here. And you can see there's very little reflectance in the UV part. Bees see the same range of colors, but shift it up. So they're seeing in UV. We don't see in UV, so to date, we haven't really investigated what about colors that are reflecting UV? Because it's very difficult, and I'm working on this, but I, I can tell you some stories about what doesn't work, to find a paint that reflects UV that's not a fluorescent uh, color because it's reflecting a color that we absolutely don't see at all. So why would anyone manufacture a invisible color? And um, <laughs> the answer is maybe there are some specialty people. There's these weird you know, fish catching guys, and they will claim, and we have to run these tests to see if it really is reflect. They say, like, here's the magic paint. These will bring in bigger bass because it's reflecting in the UV. Now, we did this with the duck decoy people who claim that their UV paints were reflecting UV, and you should paint your decoys with it. And it was like, you know, it was essentially water. There was, <laughs> it wasn't reflecting anything. So um, we didn't rat them out yet. But um, uh, so we, uh, this is a UV paint. This is the one from the duck decoy people. It is reflecting some UV, but you know, here's the rest of the color, which is a yellow. It's mostly yellow. Here's a bounce up. We're trying to work that out to see if UV is something we want to add to the arsenal. Um, uh, so anyway, long, uh, too long a story about what's intriguing me today is ultraviolet colors. Um, so, Multiple colors, and we're right now we standard on these three. This seems to work for most of the circumstances. Now, uh, we know that flowers smell. We can smell those flowers, and so bees with those things on top of their head are have these great ability to parts per billion, parts per trillion detect chemicals in their environment. Remember, a lot of their lives are underground or in complete darkness, and they are using the story would go. They are using scent as the secondary. Um, root to take them back to good patches of floral resources that they first detected by looking for color, maybe a couple other things. And so it makes sense to add scents to your traps to see if that would attract even more bees. And thankfully, it did not. So basically, there's like your perfect pie chart. We have tried since this time, these were, um, what do they call them, essential oils. So theoretically, they were, you know, as, as the flower would produce them. Uh, we've tried a million other things that don't work, and I think I have a slide, but I'll tell you the bottom line is don't use citrus oils. So you wouldn't necessarily use citrus oil, but you might use a citrus-based detergent to use in your glycol traps and your water traps because you want a detergent to cut off the um, surface tension. And the only thing that really had any impact on capture rates that you could add to the water was citrus-scented detergent. It dropped the catch dramatically because citrus oils are an insect repellent because the citrus tree wants a elephant to eat the oranges, not a <clears throat> bug, um, so to speak. So um, in the tropics, uh, Frank Parker, who is one, one of my mentors for bird, uh, bee work, he worked out a lot of the bee bowl initial stuff, he noticed that the best place to catch bees in tropical environments was the jungle bar. And I don't know if he, you know, participated in the jungle bar before, you know, uh, it became true. But when in jungle bars, you know, it wasn't uh, jungle bars would be not having, you know, a noticeable restroom. You just went outside, and the guys would pee in the bushes. And so he he would go to these, um, you know, toiletry spots, and he there'd be bees all over the place because salts and uh, probably some of the proteins and other things in urine was something that bees were highly attracted to down there, probably because of uh, tropical soils and other things. And so, but thankfully, um, and I did not, I should point out, have any high school students involved in a study using urine, but <laughs> when we look at just a uh, table salt, which may not be a complete analog anyway, but I having done my, no, I won't even tell you about my own personal tests at home, <laughs> these salt seems to have no impact either on terms of capture rate. So, we can eliminate certain things, and we now have a basic thing. Oh, here's the um, citrus um, thing that you shouldn't do. We looked at how far apart should bowls be placed so that uh, they're not competing with one another, but that are close enough that you don't lose track of them when you try and uh, put down a transect. These are fairly small bowls. So 
um, we do these things called trapping grids. And the, the color here is uh, basically analogous to the number of captures. And mathematically, what you can do is you can, can compute from these trapping grids. This is an estimating procedure. It's not useful, that useful for bees because it's a lot of work. But it does allow us, one of the parameters that you can get out of this is um, the distance at which these, in this case, traps stop competing with each other. So like to put two traps together, B has to decide this trap, that trap, you start moving them apart and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, at some point, the way to think about it is the average number of bees per trap is about the same. So it turns out that the answer is fairly short. So after three of these different studies, we found that it was somewhere between three and four meters, um, which is convenient. So we've set it at five meters apart and um, there's other reasons to think about geography and placement of traps, but at least we know that we're sort of maximizing our capture rates per bowl by setting them five meters apart or more. Okay, so of the factors affecting sample sizes, so this I found is the, always the linchpin for almost everyone's either research study and particularly for monitoring studies. And I was, I spent, a, uh, Philip may even remember this, but I spent a very early part of my career trying to figure out how many samples I needed when I was setting up monitor programs. And, I, you know, that was another whole lecture, is sample sizes. But the, the answer in, uh, the, a chunk of that answer is in terms of an actual parameter that you would bring out from data that were collected is the variation of your sample, the variability. So in trends, it's going to be variability from year to year. In another study, it'll be a variance estimate elsewhere. I, because mostly I look at variability in among <laughs> years, um, I'm going to talk about that, but the analogy and probably the ratios, like this is highly variable, are going to hold true for any kind of thing that you might study. Um, so the general principles would hold. And also when you affect sample size, you have to define what you mean by precision, you know, how you want to talk about things. And then what do you mean when you talk about, I want to look at differences, I want to look at change, I want to look at trend. You need to define those too. Again, whole lectures to uh, work on what that means that we're going to just pass over right now and, and talk to me or uh, someone else later. So um, now what I want to do is I just want to introduce, a lot of you know, coefficient of variability. It's just a standardized way to talk about variance because variance is related to the mean count. And so if I'm talking about tiny numbers or I'm talking about large numbers, I have at least a, some way of starting to standardize that. And I don't know, I've been using this for years, it's probably a more nuanced way to talk about that. Someone should email me what that is. But it's basically just the standard deviation divided by the mean. And that evens out a lot of issues. Okay, wait, did I do that? Uh, yeah. And um, so if you have a high CV, that means it's a noisy system. It's going to be harder to detect trends or differences if you, if your year-to-year -year variance, again, I'm just using that as a surrogate, other variances are useful for different kinds of questions. Um, but what the bees are doing from year to year are also going to be impacting a lot of your individual studies, which is they are very volatile, high R species. And um, so high CVs, so our goal is going to be to keep those CVs as low as possible. And we'll look at some patterns as uh, any trend so or a difference among sites is going to be hard to detect, all else being equal. If you, um, high CVs means that for any given kind of difference or detection or trend that you would like to detect, you're going to have to have many more samples. And cost is going to be higher, time is going to be higher. And um, we don't necessarily have to worry at this point, the source of variance is just variance. So the fact that some is error and some is sample, it doesn't matter. It still impacts these sample size equations or um, simulations. Um, so we're going to try and lower that as much as possible. We're looking at some of the stuff that exists in the literature. So we went in and talked to our buddies and said, give me any kind of count you have of different kinds of bee survey techniques over a series of years so that I can calculate a mean and standard deviation. We gathered those for various techniques and we looked at them in different ways. In uh, the case of uh, abundance, we saw that um, so 50% is a good goal. Like if your CV is below 50%, you're doing a, essentially what's a pretty good job. Um, you don't want to think about calculations or anything, but below uh, 50% is good. 
above 50%, 50% is there. And then when we start looking at individual species abundance, um, we start seeing that, um, and I'll get back to this in a second, but we're really super high. So this is actually a totally, you don't want to be in this kind of situation. This is the, these are the means right here, those lines across. Um, but we're looking at individual species, and I'll get back to that. The different techniques, except for the bait thing, again, um, is all about the same. So when we're looking, I'm just comparing techniques. All these different techniques, netting, malaise traps, are all showing about the same pattern in their variances. So there's not a reason to choose, other than looking at euglossian bees in the tropics, any one of these techniques over and over because they're getting lower, they're giving you lower samples or lower variance, which will mean that you can get away with uh, lower sample sizes. Um, when we drill in and we look at uh, bowls, so the, the trapping technique I like the most, and we look at individual species abundance, man, it is really high. There's the means. These are 16 different study areas or in different studies. And first of all, it's very uniform, right? Well, one of the issues here is that a lot of these are rare species. So you got lots of zeros, you got lots of zeros, and mathematically you run into an issue where your CVs are going to be um, end up being high. Um, so we look at netting, same thing essentially in terms of individual species. So let's just look at the five most common species in each of these studies. And the first thing we know is that, yeah, it really drops the CVs down, but we're not below that 50% level at all. Most of these are well above it. So um, it doesn't make things impossible, but you're going to have to work a lot harder to be able to extract information about differences or population changes in pretty much anything you do. Because even your common species, that year-to-year -year variance alone, and remember, these are coming from places that, that are blocking out all kinds of other variables. They are doing the same thing. I've got a set of traps, a trap nest, a netting, doing it the exact same way each year, same place, not confounding a lot of other variables. And still, those darn bees or populations are fluctuating. We look at netting, basically the same story. Um, we look, though, at if we change our measure, instead of the top five species, we just say all bees. I'm lumping all bees together. First of all, I've erased all kinds of really interesting natural history information. But boy, have I tamed the coefficient of variation. This, doesn't, this is worthy of further discussions as why this is. But if you're just interested, are bees, are there differences in the number of bees in this treatment and that treatment? Well, just pull everything together. Now, a lot of loss of information about the details, but remember that for in some of your cases, you're just interested in the total number of bees, right? You're answering a question, do I have more bees or do I not? And this is a potentially great solution because your CVs are way tame when you answer that question. Because at that point, these techniques are catching a lot of bees. And so that's in your favor. Netting averages, abundance, the same, maybe a little bit worse. But basically, we're still way below 50 most of the time. Um, I'll show you another study. I know I'm over time, so as usual. Um, we looked at forest service sites, glycol traps for many years, had lots of data. Um, running it um, all summer, so I'm getting rid of a lot of phenological issues, and I'm asking the same kind of questions. We get great separation among the sites, lots of genera, lots of species. Um, I look at CVs of the counts. If I look at just the changes in general, I look at these are, the average is 13%. So again, by conflating everything down to the genus, at the genus level, I am getting, these are the averages for each of the genera, um, a really good, uh, strong ability, because I have low variance among years, and able to talk about that. But I've lost a lot of that natural history information again. If I look at the total individuals, I actually, the average is 47, and if we get rid of that one, um, it's down to 38%. Also good. The total individuals be all bees are changing um, kinds of questions, or the difference <coughs> in all different bees um, across two sites or something. If I look at just honeybees, well, we got higher. The average is now up to 62%. Um, and there's a honeybee. And I'll, like uh, another species that's common, Alga chlorella, Alga chlora pura, um, I also get averaging higher species. If we look at all the bumblebees, you know, up around 50%. So it becomes reasonable. So the bottom line in terms of these kinds of issues is if you 
um, you get large gains in shrinking that CV, which is a big uh, goal to, in any kind of monitoring or study um, if you pool across species. You also get a, a, a large gain if you pool across time. So if I take all the sites I'm sampling multiple times in the year and I just mush them all together and look at that, I'm gaining large numbers of individuals and that has a large gain. If I have a study where I have 15 sites and I pull across those sites, very small gains. Probably because the differences among the sites, I'm guessing, again, we haven't parsed this out, is um, <coughs> not giving us um, very much uh, uh, power. The sites are doing, essentially are doing different things um, and are, you know, the, the um, actually, uh, so when we look at this, it's true. So if I want to predict what the CV will be five years from now from my first five years of data when I have long data sets. We did this with frog stuff, actually, amphibian data. At a site level, the first five years is highly predictive of what the CV will be for the last five years, really highly predictive. If it was high CVs initially, it's going to end up being high CVs. Um, but a, uh, in a study area that has multiple locations, the um, predictability of one site to what the other site's variances are is essentially nil. So even though they're in the same region, you know, could be feet, could be meters away, the variances are inherent to the location. And so therefore pooling things is across geographic locations is no good. And therefore analyzing things across by lumping your geographic locations or at least not allowing for uh, different trajectories by site is going to be something you have to take into effect. All right, you know, so I'm way over, so I'm going to skip over, like, how do you figure out how many bowls you have? Um, I am really close to the end here, though. So specimen processing, just to get back to that, we have spent ungodly amounts of time working out how to efficiently process thousands and thousands of specimens as quickly as possible. Our bees per minute are the best in the world. So you can look at our YouTube videos to figure that out. This is, you know, one component, end component of how, you know, in a, our workflow. And um, the future will be that identification will be taken care of by the uh, molecular people. I'm now, I used to scoff at this, but now I believe that we really will be able to just grind up samples and get um, counts out of that. There finally is my last slide, and that's my email address down there. And I'm happy to talk over a beer tonight or to uh, answer questions by email because I've skipped over like a thousand things, most of which is the species biology, which is way more interesting than some of these sampling things. So thank you.